Hello, welcome and good morning, Revolution. Hi, everybody. Scott, Michael, happy May Day. Yay, May Day. <laughs> International Workers Day. Yeah, it's great. You know, there are strikes all day today. Whole Foods, Walmart, where else? Amazon. Amazon. Um, I saw um, a map of the United States with all of the strike actions going on. Mm. And it was just, I mean, everywhere. Um, something like 150 different strike actions happening. Wow, that is incredible. That's um, and, the, and a lot of these are not, you know, people who are organized into unions or their their people are getting up and walking out of their jobs in protest. Well, they're catching hell. You can't blame them, uh, uh, Michael. They're, they're not giving, a ma I was talking to my stepdaughter, my goddaughter rather, and she, her husband works and uh, for a telephone company and they, won, they were telling them where a, a handkerchief, they were handing out handkerchiefs at the, you know, what is the matter? And then at the, in New York, at the subway workers transit, they started putting on their own masks and gloves. They said, oh no, you can't do that. You're breaking the dress code. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna illustrate maybe the difference between that, which is the capitalist response to, to this crisis and you know, what a working class response is. Um, I live in a small town, right? Um, a friend of my mom's, um, she's, she has a medical condition, so she's kind of um, immune compromised, had to really stay at home, isolate herself. Starting at the beginning of the pandemic, she, she has made 5,000 masks. 5,000 masks hmm. that she started giving out first to, you know, um, workers in the, the local hospital, but then that's, I think, about a mask for every person in the town that she lives in. Isn't that incredible? And if you gave one to uh, Mr. Pence, the food wear one. Did you see that, Michael? It's awful. It's awful. I was just thinking, you know, it's interesting how we can't break the rules, but you walk outside and there's people, you know, in suits here in New York City who are surely aren't wearing masks and walking in the buildings. I know what I want to know what's getting said to them when they walk in. You know, do they get threatened with getting escorted yeah. out or such? These people's arrogance it, it's gonna be their undoing. You what? Yeah. At the at the golf, the, the the country club in my town, it's way up in a on a hill overlooking one of our public parks. Mm. Um, I wanted to go, you know, take a walk on the paths in the park, but that was closed. But the uh, the golf club was open because it had, it had been deemed an essential service, and there were you know six people out on the out of town. patio having beers, and there were little you know um, groups of golfers going around in golf carts and. Like what, what, what are these people thinking? Golfing is essential. <laughs> Nobody told you? <laughs> They're not taking it seriously. You know, they don't take climate change seriously and they don't take the pandemic seriously. It's this, it's almost an attack on science. Like there's an attack on women and an attack on the black community and immigrants. There's an attack on science. There really is. And, there, and there's a sense of, of, that they're, they're going to be insulated from the consequences of this. You know, whatever happens, they're going to have health care. You know, when the climate crisis gets to their doorstep, they're going to be able to evacuate somewhere. Like, you know, it's, it's the, the stakes are different depending on, on, you know, where you are within the, the class system of this country. But these boys, they do take themselves seriously. And that's, that's, the, uh, that's the problem. Uh, and it's a very serious situation. Did you see that in Michigan and Lansing again, these fools broke into the state capitol, the uh, assembly was meeting and they tried to break in and they were armed. And, you know, can you imagine, I was listening to Al Sharpton on the news this morning. He said, can you imagine if people on the left did that? Yeah. Or, Imagine if a group of Black Lives Matter protesters oh my God, called out the National Guard, yeah, CIA, FBI. It would be like a Kent State massacre again. It, it would be. It would be the the move uh, bombing. It would. Yeah, um, the, the double standard is just the double standard. The double standard is just so. Oh, they're just good old boys. <laughs> well, that's what's scary. That's huh? what's scary is that you know 
that's what we're up against. We started, you know, let's go back to 2016. Trump was talking about Muslim bans and building a walls. We've gone from that to, um, you know, the, the prison camps or the concentration camps for children in cages, immigrant children. Yeah. Then we had the impeachment. Now we have this where he says it's a Chinese hoax, just like a climate change. You know, I knew about it, but it wasn't a big deal. It just gets worse and worse. And now you have the kind of uh, base support or the most extreme of his base support, you know, arming themselves saying, no, we got to get back to work. Screw the social distancing. It doesn't help us. So that's what we're up against. But you know what they're up against? 90% of the American people are saying they support the social distancing. And, and we, we've got to be clear that we, we support uh, the American people. We support workers. Um, the demand for social distancing is appropriate. We need to, to get rid of this virus. But the working class cannot be made to pay the price for that response. So it has to be social distancing, keep the, the you know, so-called lockdown measures in place, but also provide relief um, for, for workers and, and for, you know, the small businesses who are, who are hurting because of this. Um, and that's, that's the issue right now, because unemployment now is 20%, they're saying, 20% which means in black and brown communities is 40%. Yeah. Actually, it's even higher than 20% and 40% because they don't count in that figure because they think we don't count people who supposedly have you know, given up looking for a work. And there is hunger stuck in the land. I mean, that's not an exaggeration. People are on, are on food lines, you yeah. know, going a mile or two down the road you know, in New Jersey. Yep. other places uh, around the country. And the big question is uh, what to do about it, you know? And it's time to start organizing the unorganized unemployed. I mean, because without that kind of organization and effort, you know, the ruling class is gonna do what the ruling class is gonna do, you know? And, um, and that means, um, as you say, force the burden on us. And, um, and people aren't having it in these strikes and the rent strikes and the other protest actions are an indication of it. And you raise an important point there about, about organization because I think there's sometimes this fantasy on, on the left that if things just get bad enough, people are gonna spontaneously, you know, rise up and, and throw off the chains of oppression or whatever. And there is an element of spontaneity. People, people are coming to different conclusions about society based on what's happening. But what enables that, that anger um, to become a political force is organization and mm -hmm. solidarity. And that has to be built. Oppression does not necessarily breed resistance. If that was the case, we would never have slavery. We never have had the Nazi concentration camps, even though there were resistance in both. Uh, but remember that uh, fascism had to be had to be overthrown, and uh, sadly, because the preparatory movement to defeat it was not successful, it was divided. The socialists were divided against the communists. The communists were divided against the Christians. Everybody was divided against each other. You know. And uh, um, uh, and and that was 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 the that division allowed the fascists to just slide right in there. And once they grabbed a hold of state power, they didn't want to let it go, Michael. They didn't want to let it go. That's the awful thing. I think we have to keep in mind what exactly it is that we're up against. But that the good sign in all this, and the way that we can really celebrate May Day, is that people are uniting against the Trump agenda. And it's been, you know, kind of all this coming together over the past few years and then the pandemic and, you know, the strike wave today from Walmart to Amazon, it's all coming together and people are really uniting around issues. So that is something to celebrate. That's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. And we had a mask challenge today. Uh, did you get your mask in, Michael? I did. I did send in my picture. I um, I sent in a picture of myself holding my favorite piece of Marxist literature and a mask. So be on the lookout for that. All right, Scott, you got yours in? Ah, uh, you even brought yours with you. 
Uh, showing off. <laughs> Show, showing off. Ain't nothing wrong with it. Tonight we have a rally in uh, New York, and it starts at 7. You can find it at cpusa.org, and then there's a dance party in Chicago. Um, Those things are based in New York and, and Chicago, but they're they're online, of course. We're not. They're online. We're not have, uh, you can you can you can log on, check in, call in, and join us. And we invite you to do so, because there ain't no party like the Communist Party. And know? this is this is a celebration of, in a sense, what what, what Michael was saying. But there, there's reason to be optimistic and to be joyful about this. And. It, this is an expression of our faith and um, our partisanship uh, of the working class, toward the working class. One of the amazing things, maybe to my mind, the most amazing thing about Marx and, and Engels and Lenin is that they were able to, in a time when industrial workers were only just beginning to get organized, mm. uh, when the factory system was new, when um, when conditions were dire and desperate and illiteracy was still, you know, very common in the working class, they were able to look at the working class and see not, you know, a group of, of you know, wretched um, victims or whatever. They were able to see the force that could liberate humanity from oppression and exploitation. And they, they held to that and, and developed that and, and were now, you know, as we have, you know, in the past, seeing the fruits, like and that the force, working class. Is the, that force is still with us and is still active uh, and is still revolutionary. And there are a lot of attempts to push us away from it, to divert us from the working class and the class struggle. Like I was reading the other day, there was a piece in monthly review. They were talking about angles, for example, and they said that the big problem in the West was uh, the, the, uh, those workers, you know, they got bought off, you know, uh, what did they call them? Uh, labor aristocracy, you know? Um, I even read a piece by the, one of the writers who did that book that was so popular uh, about 10 years ago called Empire Negri and- mm, Hard and Negri, yeah. And, and the dude said that the workers in the West, in particular in Europe, were so bought up, all oh, y'all, all we can do is have solidarity actions with the third world. That is the extent of our revolutionary uh, activity. And so the dude who was writing in Monthly Review said, well, there was a big problem in the United States up until about three or four years ago, but now with globalization, the workers are suffering, and by workers he means white workers, mm -hmm. I, I suppose. And, and so now the labor aristocracy is not such a big deal, which was the point the Communist Party made 40 years ago. And yeah, um, and, and this idea that it's only been the past three or four years that, that um, white workers have begun to suffer from globalization or that oh, the, the labor okay. movement has begun to address um, kind of mass solidarity, that, that's, that's completely wrong. Productivity in the United States, highest in the world. Why? Because the rate of speed up is the most intense in the world. And the, and the automation. Rate of exploitation among the highest in the world. Union, uh, unionization rates, the lowest in the world. Why? I, I think this, this idea of the labor aristocracy, um, the, the way it's often used now strikes me as a kind of misreading of, of the, the result of anti-communism, right? The well, communists were chased out of the labor movement um, and, and reactionary forces were enabled to, you know, to gain a toehold there. Mm. Um, I mean, communists stayed in, we kept fighting, you know, in different ways, but um, that it, it wasn't, that wages were too high and, and some workers were bought off. It was that the, the movement um, without that militant working class, you know, communist presence took some steps in the wrong direction. And it's a, and it's a downplaying of, 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 of what the, the psychological wage of, of racism 
uh, and anti-communism and, and how they contributed to dividing the uh, uh, working class. I'm gonna be talking about that tomorrow at the party uh, Marxist school in the afternoon. We have a school all day tomorrow. Um, and uh, and uh, so those of you who have, uh, you know, signed up for it, you know, I'm gonna be holding uh, a conversation and I hope that we can have a little bit of dialogue about uh, about these and 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 some other uh, uh, issues. And it's going to be it's going to be some heavy topics. Um, we start off with the uh, role and organization of the party. So what we do and how we set ourselves up to do that. Mm. Um, and then um, Joe's uh, uh, presentation on um, you're on the the ultra left. Ultra left, and I'm going to be approaching it from the standpoint of the radicalization process that's taking place in the country and how it's impacting ideology. And, and then um, our, our final section of the consciousness, huh? Sorry. And then the final section will sort of um, uh, continue that discussion of class consciousness and, and ideology, but uh, with a focus on what are the major struggles ahead, what needs to be done right now in order to um, stop the the growth of the fascist threat, defeat the right, and put us on the, the path to socialism. That's going to be a good school tomorrow, a good set of classes, just because we're getting so many questions, you know, in our email box and our mail bag and such, um, from new potential members and people who have just joined, you know, in this significant moment of growth, really ever since the Trump, um, you know, the presidency started, we've been growing nonstop, but especially now with Bernie's dropping out and the radicalization process, as Joe was talking about increasing, um, but they come to us with some really interesting questions that need to be addressed. And so that's why it's good that we're having this school tomorrow. Food for thought, y'all, food for thought. Um, and uh, with that, I think we have to bring this to a close because we got to get ready for May Day. Uh, Michael is speaking. And uh, uh, we've got some music going on, and you can shake your booty in Chicago. <laughs> and uh, we've got another event in, in Cleveland. No, no, uh, uh, Columbus, all around the country. We're celebrating May Day, and we invite you to uh, join us and join with us. And if you want to join, join the party. You know, we're under new management, <laughs> you know, uh, we're growing and we're fighting and uh, we need your support. So with that, happy May Day, y'all. Um, and we'll see you next week. Take care. Take care.